Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So till now uh, we have discussed about uh, you know criteria for precipitation then how microstructure and interface between the matrix and precipitate uh, they change during aging treatment and then how dislocations interact with precipitates and how the interaction changes during aging right we have discussed all these and also we have uh, discussed about how the strength and hardness changes with aging with respect to radius and aging time we have discussed that right so today what we are going to discuss is the effect of temperature first so what is the effect of temperature on the aging curve and then we will talk about the dispersion strengthening okay so let's talk about first effect of temperature so to understand that let me first draw the phase diagram Okay, so we have temperature here, then weight percent of say uh, B, right? So we are talking about A and B, and we have discussed about the uh, alloy, A aluminum, four percent copper alloy. Okay, so here we are talking about A and B. So this is alpha, which is single phase. then we have alpha plus l and then alpha plus beta okay so now uh, let's take uh, uh, two temperatures here say we are aging the alloy we are taking uh, say this particular composition okay having the concentration of c not and so this will be something like this right this particular composition now let's take two alloys here one is at temperature t1 and another one at temperature t2 okay and here t2 is greater than t1 okay now uh, since we are aging it beta will come out from the alpha matrix and this beta is actually precipitated okay so if we age it at t1 we are going to have this much of beta volume fraction eventually at equilibrium condition and at temperature t2 this is the beta fraction right if you use lever rule you are going to get the volume fraction of beta and alpha respectively right so the here this much at t1 and this much at t2 is your uh, fraction of beta in the microstructure okay so let's uh, talk about it so at high temperature so in this case t2 what you are going to see is smaller volume fraction of precipitates okay so you can see here at t2 you have very small volume fraction right compared to at temperature t1 so t1 here you have higher volume fraction so at lower temperature t1 you have higher volume fraction of precipitates okay so now you already know depending upon the volume fraction your hardness is going to change isn't it 
So the higher the volume fraction of the precipitate, you are going to observe the higher hardness of the alloy, right? So this also means that at lower temperature, which is T1 here, you are going to have higher hardness of the alloy compared to a temperature T2, which is higher than T1, okay? So as you increase the temperature, since the volume fraction of the precipitate decreases, the hardness of the alloy is also going to decrease. That is point number one, okay? Now the second is, at higher temperature, you have more driving force, right? Diffusion is faster. That means you have higher kinetics. What does it mean? It means that the precipitates can form much earlier, right? If you are at higher temperature, because you are the diffusion is more there, isn't it? And at lower temperature, you have lower kinetics. So as you increase the temperature, in this case from T1 to T2, the kinetics also increases. That also means that the precipitate formation is going to be faster when the temperature, aging temperature is increased, okay? This also means that the time to reach the peak hardness is going to be lower at higher temperature. Okay, so that uh, suppose we have a, a peak aged uh, uh, hardness for lower temperature is H1, okay, and at high temperature H2, the peak hardness I'm talking about, then the time to reach H1 will be higher than the time to reach H2. Okay, so these are the two things we need to know. So the first point is, as temperature increases, what is going to happen? Your hardness is going to decrease. That is point number one, because the volume fraction of the precipitate is going to decrease. Now, second point, as temperature increases time to reach peak hardness is also going to decrease, okay? So when you increase the aging temperature, both hardness as well as time to reach peak uh, hardness will also decrease, okay? So these are the two things you are going to observe with respect to aging temperature. So now if I plot the aging curve, we have discussed aging curve, right? So let's now plot and uh, whatever we discussed before was for a particular temperature. Now we are changing the temperature. So let's look at it, how it is going to change with aging temperature. So we have hardness. Then age in time here. Okay. So you're going to have some hardness, even if you don't age it because of solute solution is strengthening and that will be our next topic. Okay. So you're going to see something like this. Okay. Say temperature T1. Now, if I increase it, increase the temperature, you're going to see something like this. Then if I increase furthermore, it is going to be something like this, okay? So T1, T2, and T3, where T3 is higher than T2 and then T1, okay? So let me... So this is your peak hardness at temperature T1 and time to reach the peak hardness, which is small T1, okay, at temperature T1. And then this is your peak hardness at temperature T2 and the corresponding time 
let us denote it using T2 and then at temperature T3, the time to reach the peak hardness. So let me also write, so, okay, so this is your T3 here and let me write the peak hardness value H1, H2, H3, okay. So the sequence will be S3 is going to be lower than S2 and then H1. And similarly, T3 is going to be lower than T2, then T1, okay. So as you increase the agent temperature, which is here, okay, your both hardness and time to reach the peak hardness is going to decrease and that is what is observed in the aging curve I have drawn here, okay. So now you know how the precipitate size, uh, et cetera, changes with respect to time and how the aging curve changes with respect to time at a particular temperature. Then we just learned how the, the aging curve changes when you change the aging temperature, okay. So now let me uh, go to another important point. So if you uh, remember uh, when we are talking about the uh, steps for aging treatment, uh, steps for uh, uh, precipitation, right? The first step was solution treatment, then we quenched it and then we aged the alloy, right? So then our question comes, why do you want to quench it, right? Why don't you uh, slow cool it and form uh, uh, beta, right? Anyway, the equilibrium structure based on the phase diagram. So if you see here, based on the phase diagram, the equilibrium structure is alpha plus beta, isn't it? So if you go to alpha region, single phase region and do solution treatment, you could have slowly cooled it and formed alpha plus beta. Why do you want to quench it first and then age it again, right? And wasting some amount of energy by heating it again, isn't it? Right? So what is the necessity of quenching it rather than slowly cooling it after you have solution treated the alloy? Okay? So let's understand that concept. So the question is, why do we need to quench the alloy? After solution treatment, we are talking about. And not slowly cool it. Okay, because based on the phase diagram, we are going to get alpha plus beta, even if we slowly cool it. Okay. So let's uh, understand that. So suppose you are going to uh, high temperature so you are in this particular region. Okay, I'm, I have phase diagram here now. So you are here. Okay, then we are quenching it rather than slowly cooling it. So what is happening? Right? If you slowly cool it, the process is very slow and consider it that you are doing everything at high temperature and then you are slowly cooling it to room temperature. So you are spending sufficient amount of time at, at high temperature so that you uh, the diffusion is uh, faster there, okay? Because you are uh, uh, spending sufficient amount of time at high temperature. Okay, while you're slowly cooling it. So what will happen if you see your microstructure after slowly cooling it, you have say, say these this drain boundaries. Okay, so since you're slowly cooling it, you're giving sufficient amount of time for B atoms to come out from the alpha matrix, if this is alpha here. 
chemistry and we have alpha plus beta. So B atoms will come out from the alpha matrix and they are going to form beta phase, right? And since you are giving sufficient amount of time and the temperature is also higher, you have lo lots of diffusion going on. There is a possibility that the atoms here, they will diffuse to gain boundaries and they are going to form precipitates at the drain boundary itself, something like this. Okay, because the diffusion is faster, you are giving sufficient amount of time also. So atoms have sufficient driving force to move from interior of the drain to at the drain boundary and form beta phase. Now these beta phase are what? They are intermetallic in nature, right? So they're brittle in nature. Now, if you start doing tensile test of this particular alloy, this beta phase is going to fail right away. Okay, so you are going to get intergranular fracture. So this beta phase here, they are going to fail all this, right? And you are going to observe fracture through the drain boundary. So we call it intergranular fracture. Okay, and you don't want that, isn't it? The whole purpose of doing aging treatment is to increase the strength, but you don't want to lose ductility completely. Okay, there should be sufficient ductility as well if you want to, if you are increasing the strength. Okay, so what do we do? Instead of slowly cooling it, so this is the case of slowly cooling. So instead of slowly cooling it, we are doing going to quench it. So if you quench it, you're, you're going to form super saturated solid solution. We have discussed that. Okay. And now you are heating it again. But remember, you're not heating it to a very high temperature, right? And but your B atoms, they want to come out because that is not equilibrium condition. The supersaturated solid solution is not at equilibrium still, right? So B atoms will want to come out. So if you remember, we had discussed this before. So if I am aging it at this particular temperature, so there is this much of supersaturation, right? Equilibrium suggests, this phase diagram suggests that the solubility is only here, right? But we have extra B atoms, this much. So this much B atoms, will try to come out as soon as possible so that the whole system is in equilibrium, okay? But you are not at very high temperature when you age it, right? But you are giving some driving force so that atoms can move. But again, atoms want to come out quickly and then form beta phase because they want to achieve, uh, go through it, uh, achieve equilibrium, right? So what will happen? They will start forming precipitate inside. It's obviously you are going to observe some precipitates also at the drain boundaries. No one is denying that. But apart from the drain boundaries, you are also going to observe precipitates interior inside the drain. Okay, now if you compare the one microstructure where we have slowly cooled it. There you had a continuous film of Al2Cu, if we are talking about aluminum copper, or say beta phase. Not if you compare, you don't have a continuous film of beta phase. They are distributed inside the drain as well as drain boundary. And this is what we want. So you have sufficient ductility also. So this is the structure of quenching plus aging. Okay, so you are doing both here. But that is the reason why we first quench the alloy and then age it. We do not slowly cool it. Okay, so that we can avoid the formation of beta phase at the drain boundary, continuous film of beta phase at the drain boundary. Got it? Okay, so this is uh, much uh, I wanted to discuss in uh, precipitation strengthening. So what I'm going to do now is to uh, talk about something called dispersion strengthening, okay? So we'll discuss about
dispersion strengthening okay the name suggests you know you have dispersed something and because of that you are getting some strengthening in the alloy okay so now the question is what do we disperse okay so let's understand that so in this uh, mechanism the strength is enhanced by the addition of dispersed whites okay so you are adding dispersed whites and these dispersed whites are actually hindering or say restricting the movement of dislocations remember when i started talking about strengthening mechanism the first thing i mentioned that the whole mechanism all these mechanisms are based on the restriction of movement of dislocations okay so previously we talked about precipitation strengthening where precipitates we are responsible for the move, restriction in the movement of dislocations here dispersed soils are restricting the movement of dislocations and thereby increasing the strength of a given alloy okay so what are dispersed soils so they are hard and insoluble second phase okay so i will tell you what do i mean by insoluble second phase okay so now let's consider the difference between precipitates and dispersed soils right so if you remember the precipitates they are forming from the matrix itself so when you quench it and then age it this beta phase were coming from the alpha matrix right so these precipitates were forming in situ they were coming out from the matrix itself in dispersion it's strengthening this dispersed soils are added from outside so you are adding say oxides nitrides so some some uh, you know hard particle okay you are adding it from outside so that is one of the differences between precipitates and dispersed soils now second difference is that if you talk about precipitation strengthening uh, strengthen alloys if you go to high temperature right those precipitates which you have formed during aging treatment can again dissolve back right and that was the first treatment if you remember the solution treatment itself right so the precipitation hardenable alloys those are they are not uh, very suitable if you want to work at very high temperature because the precipitates will dissolve back and then the strengthening will be lost okay if we compare that to dispersion strengthening alloy the dispersed soils on the other hand they are sol insoluble at higher temperature not we are not talking about to melting point okay we are talking about a uh, temperature like in uh, uh, precipitation hardenable alloys we are talking about say solution treatment temperature so in the same range if you talk about for dispersion strengthen in alloy these dispersed soils they are not going to dissolve okay they will be stable there okay that this also means uh, that these type of alloys where we are adding dispersed soils they are suitable for applications at higher temperature as compared to precipitation hardenable alloys okay so these are the two main differences you have between dispersed soils and precipitates and correspondingly uh, dispersion strengthening alloy and precipitation strengthening alloy okay so let's uh, write it down very quickly 
So dispersed soils, you add it from outside. Okay. And if you remember precipitates, they formed from the matrix. Okay, like beta phase form from the alpha matrix. Okay, but here we are adding from outside dispersoids. Okay, now the second difference is dispersion. Hardened system maintain strength at high temperatures. Okay, and if I talk about precipitates, so in so in the bracket when I'm writing, there is a contrast, right, between dispersion hardened system and precipitation hardenable alloys. So in precipitation hardenable systems. precipitates will dissolve back. In the matrix, okay. And this also means not very suitable for high temperature. Say solution treatment temperature, something like that. Okay, why? Because you're dissolving the precipitates back into the matrix. So if precipitates have dissolved, there is uh, you know no one to restrict the movement of dislocations, right? Obviously there will be some lattice uh, resistance there, but you're going to lose the strength you had achieved while aging. Okay, so these are the two main differences between uh, uh, precipitates, uh, precipitation hardenable system and disperse, uh, dispersion hardenable system. So one and two. Okay, now what are the examples? So if I talk about examples for dispersion hardenable system, you have aluminum and then say Al two O three. Okay or say proper Al2O3. And then one of the famous is, you know, ODS steels, which are being used in nuclear power plants. So ODS means, or side dispersion strengthening steels. Okay, so these are ferritic uh, steels with high chromium. Okay, and then you are adding yttria. So Y2O3. So you are adding yttria, they act as a dispersoids in the matrix and thereby they provide strength at higher temperature. So these are being used, these OD steels are being used in nuclear power plant also. Okay, so now uh, uh, we know that the strength is coming from the dispersoids because they are restricting the movement of dislocations. Now what is the mechanism? So if you remember previously when we were talking about precipitation, uh, hardenable alloys, we discussed about two mechanisms. So dislocations can either bypass the precipitates or dislocations can cut the precipitates, right? Now that will depend upon whether it is coherent, incoherent, or the, also the size, right? And we discussed also that if the size is small and the precipitate is coherent, right? Then it is going to shear. Now this dispersoid, since you are adding from outside, 
in most of the cases the interface between the precipitate or sorry dispersed soils and the matrix is going to be incoherent in nature okay this also means that in most of the cases uh, dislocations are going to bypass the dispersed soils they are not going to cut it because the interface is incoherent in nature okay so that is the mechanism so mechanism if you see the interface between the matrix and dispersed soils is incoherent okay and if it is incoherent it is going to bowing around of dislocations around dispersed soils okay so they are not able to cut dislocations are going to bypass the dispersed soils and thereby increasing the strength of that particular dispersion strengthening alloy okay so uh, we have completed precipitation strengthening mechanism we have also completed uh, dispersion strengthening mechanism see the concept remains same both dispersion strengthening uh, a mechanism and the precipitation strengthening mechanism only thing is there is a difference between dispersed soils and precipitates which we have already discussed so let me quickly uh, give you very two basic uh, uh, problems okay based on the distance between the precipitates and the size of the precipitates and rest you will do in the assignment also okay so suppose i have an alloy okay aluminum alloy and we are aging it okay so we aged it and after aging we have uh, two conditions so in first condition uh, the precipitate size was let's say suppose you know 30 nanometer okay and the strength you measured strength the tau value and that you got say 100 mpe okay now the question is if you change the say aging uh, condition and the precipitate size is is now say 60 nanometer then what is the strength okay so you are talking about same alloy system so g remains same b will remain same means material properties are going to remain same okay so you are changing the aging condition and because of the changing aging aging condition precipitate size in cha is changing so strength is going uh, uh, is 100 mpa when precipitate size is 30 nanometer and if precipitate size is 60 nanometer what is the strength and you are assuming that you have cutting of precipitates okay this means it is on the left side from the peak case condition okay so it is very simple right we discussed before that tau is directly proportional to root r so you know what is the size here right so say if size if we consider size to be d diameter which is 30 nanometer so you know d1 and remember r is the radius here right so d1 is known and d2 is known and d1 corresponding strength say tau1 that is known 100 mpa so 
So you have to figure out what is tau 2. So if you have this particular equation, right, you can write it down as tau 1 by tau 2 equal to root over r1 by root over r2. Okay. So now you know diameter is known, d1 and d2. So you know what is r1 is 15 and r2 is 30 nanometer. Okay. So you can now use this particular equation. You can find out what is tau2 that is given by tau1 root over r2 divided by root over r1. Now you have all the values. You know what is tau1, you know what is r2, you know what is r1, so you can calculate what is tau2. Okay, so this is one uh, simple problem. Another one is uh, related to the distance between the precipitate. That means we are talking about now bowing around the precipitate, okay, a bowing around of dislocations. So, say again, aluminum alloy we are talking about. And you have age date, right? So size is now larger because we are talking about bypassing. Right? So say uh, the size is uh, uh, size is larger. So let's talk about distance. So previously, say you had distance of lambda one as uh, one micron meter, and then the distance average distance has increased to say lambda 2 as 2.5 micron meter. Okay, so you have age date and the distance, average distance between the particles precipitates, they, it has increased from 1 micron meter to 2.5 micron meter. And the strength corresponding to this was supposed tau 1 as again 100 MPa. So you have to figure out what is going to be tau 2. Okay, and you here you are assuming that dislocations by are going to bypass. The precipitates. Okay. The previous one was related to cutting. This problem is related to bypassing. Okay, so here also we have discussed the formula, right? So stress required to go a dislocation that is given by GB by lambda, you remember, right? So we can write it here again, tau one is equal to GB by lambda one. Now GB will remain same because the material is same. So tau two here is GB by lambda two, okay? So we can write tau one by tau, tau two as lambda 2 by lambda 1. GB, GB will cancel out. Okay. Now you know all the values. You see here tau 1 is known. Uh, sorry, tau 1 here. Tau 1 is known. Lambda 1 is known. Lambda 2 is known. So you have to calculate what is tau 2. So tau 2 from this equation is given as tau 1 lambda 1 by lambda 2. So you can calculate. You know all the values. Isn't it? So these are the two simplest uh, 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 problems related to precipitation strengthening. And uh, you will know more in the assignments. Okay. So next, we are going to discuss about uh, solid solution strengthening.